Theropod dinosaurs may have been the dominant land predators in their own time, but would they be as impactful in a world of mammals? This video takes theropod dinosaurs from North America and analyzes how they would fare in the Cenozoic, ranging from the Paleocene to the Ice Age. Particular attention will be paid to the four big challenges that the theropods would face in the Cenozoic. The rat problem, the mammoth problem, the weather problem, and the human problem. We'll be taking a thousand of each theropod from their own time and plopping them into each period of the Cenozoic to see how they could survive and adapt. Let's meet the team. First off are the aggro players, the theropods that specialize in small to medium game. While not mega theropods, they're iconic and deserve to be here. Deinonychus is a part of this category along with its larger relative Utah Raptor. Ceratosaurus, while a giant by modern carnivore standards, also fits into aggro at 500 to 700 kilograms. Next up are the mid-range players. These theropods aren't above picking on small prey, but are more than capable of taking on megafauna. The impeccable gentleman Allosaurus is the poster child for mid-range, and it leads a group of Tyrannosaurus. Albertosaurus, Teratophonius, Despletosaurus, Lithronex, and Nanuxaurus, if it's valid, cover both speed and power. The rest of the team falls into the battle cruiser tier, the carnivores that the Cenozoic would view as demons. Siots Micorum probably goes here, although nobody knows for sure how big it is or even what kind of theropod it is. It's either a Megaraptoran or a Carcharodontosaur, but nobody really knows. More solid additions include Torvosaurus Tanneri, one of the terrors of the Morrison, Acrocanthosaurus Atticensis, the sail-backed Carcharodontosaur that roamed all across the continent, Sorphagonex Maximus, the gigantic sauropod-hunting Allosaur that lived in a Jurassic furnace, Tyrannosaurus macrensis, a southern tyrant, and Tyrannosaurus rex, the lizard king itself. The invasion begins with the Paleocene. North America, once it recovered from the asteroid impact, was warm and temperate and covered in thick forests. The average global temperature was 24 to 25 degrees Celsius, comparable to most of the Mesozoic, and flowering plants were very common. The Paleocene was actually quite diverse, considering the devastating asteroid impact that had just taken place. Even large carnivores had already popped up, including Encalagon the Black <coughs> and Caligon Sorgnathus, a bear-sized mesonychid from New Mexico. There's actually a theme of bear and wolf-like carnivores from across multiple families, including Arctocyon, Paleonictus, and Triicidon. Mammals quickly developed predators on the scale of today's largest land carnivores, but they never really got any bigger. At least in the Paleocene, it wouldn't have made sense to get bigger. The food supply simply wasn't there. Early primate relatives don't provide much of a motivation to grow large, and even the biggest animals of the time period, like the 300 kg Uintothere Probathiopsis, wouldn't have supported predators on a larger scale. Peritychus, a cat-sized omnivore, and Psittacotherium, a dog-sized digging animal, provide some options for snacks, but weren't as easy to catch. The same lack of supply that prevented giant mammalian carnivores from evolving would be a severe thorn in the side of the theropod team. Many of the invading theropods are an order of magnitude bigger than any of the Paleocene animals, and would have metabolic demands to match. The thick forests covering North America wouldn't provide much room for maneuvering, which would be both a curse and a blessing. The theropods would be cramped, but it would also make ambushes much easier for the entire team. Probathiopsis would become the equivalent of a Happy Meal, given its relatively large body size and lack of weaponry, but is still too small to sustain anything Allosaurus size or larger. Selective pressure would force the theropods to decrease body size and increase their agility to succeed in the tangled woods. The aggro dinos, especially the dromaeosaurs, were already in a great size range to take advantage of the available food and would likely become the dominant predators of the area. Some might develop digging claws or climbing adaptations to pursue the tricky mammals. The agrotheropods would rule as the apex predators, thriving on the native rhino population as their larger teammates starved. Next is the Eocene, a 32 million year stretch that swung between 23 and 28 Celsius. The forests began to resemble our modern variety as plants like maples, elms, birches, and cherries appeared, and the warm climate allowed for large ectotherms like alligators to spread as far north as Canada and Alaska. The late Eocene saw a temperature decrease and a forest shrinkage, opening up plains and savannas all across the continent, but was still quite warm. How about prey and competition? Luckily, the Eocene has a much more expansive menu for the theropod team. Early beavers, while not ideal prey for the land-adapted hunters, are still cool and worth mentioning. In terms of a realistic diet, the Eocene has sheep-sized herbivorous artiodactyls like Agrocurus, perfect for the smaller dromaeosaurs. Entelodonts and pseudohippos arrive, and while likely dangerous pound for pound, their 200kg bodies would be snacks for most of the invaders. 
Uintithiers and Brontithiers, including Eobazuleus, Uintithirium, and Megacerops, ranged from 2 to nearly 4 tons. That's the perfect size for the mid-range in battlecruiser theropods, who are used to taking on ceratopsians, hadrosaurs, and small sauropods. These rhino-like animals aren't as heavily armed as the ceratopsians their new enemies hunted either, and wouldn't have any experience in fighting predators their own size or bigger. They'd be the entrees, and more appetizers include tapir relatives, camel cousins, and hornless rhinos. Early horses are an interesting one. They were already built for speed, and weren't large enough to be worth a the chase for most theropods. The only invaders that could catch them were likely the medium-sized and juvenile tyrannosaurs. They might not bother though, given the much higher yield of meat from the slower, bigger options. Horses are doing fine. In terms of competition, the Eocene is less generous. There are Amphicyanids, or bear dogs, which are still too diminutive to take on any of the theropods bigger than Deinonychus. The same goes for the Hyenodons, which max out at about 1.5 meters. They'd likely focus on the smaller mammals and stay small themselves in order to avoid having to deal with the theropod threat, skulking in the shadows like a flashback to the Mesozoic. The Eocene would likely cause another body size reduction for the theropods to deal with relatively small prey. Medium-sized Tyrannosaurs would thrive, as they represent the perfect blend of speed and power, so taxa like Albertosaurus and Lithronax would be terrors for the rhino-sized mammals. This dynamic would favor the theropods that were already relatively small and strong, so the Eocene would mainly belong to the mid-range members. The Oligocene is next on trial. Running from 34 to 23 million years ago, it's a bit cooler than previous periods with a global average of 22 to 24 Celsius. There was a cooling event at the start of the Oligocene that prompted the growth of ice sheets, and it gradually warmed up afterwards. Savannas and grasslands became common, which allowed for the radiation of large browsing animals. Good news for our theropod friends. Deciduous forests dominated in the mid Oligocene as well, so there was a mix of habitats to adapt to. The greater the habitat diversity, the better the options for prey, at least in theory. The huge dinocerates of the Eocene have vanished, replaced by rhinocerontids like Dicerotherium that max out at a single metric ton. Intelodonts, tapirs, and amphicyanids are still there, along with early bears. Camelids populate North America as well, and the oreodonts, which are herbivorous, medium-sized artiodactyls, are everywhere. Some even lived in herds, which would make them great food options for smaller theropods. At least the competition hasn't grown any more stiff, apart from the garial relative Thecacampsa that would be threatening the waterways. But if anything, the Oligocene would be more difficult for the dinosaurs. There's less food for the battlecruisers than before, so it would really be up to the aggro and midrange to keep a foothold. Again, they'd survive and become the dominant large carnivores, but at the cost of their heaviest hitters. The mammals just haven't figured out how to become big enough to sustain true megatheropods, starving out the dragons instead of fighting them. That changes in the Miocene, which ran from 23 to 5 million years ago. Chillier than early stages of the Cenozoic, it's only 3 to 4 Celsius warmer than today. And I know you're excited for how theropods would handle the dangers of the Ice Age, and I am too, but some really important things happen in the Miocene that we need to talk about. Prairies and grasslands expand, and some mountain building kicks up in North America, but I'm talking about animal innovations that will completely alter the competitive landscape. What's worked for the mammals so far has continued to work. Horses, camels, amphicyanids, and rhinos are still thriving. The newcomers include the omnivore Deodon Shoshonensis, which has had its fair share of time travel shenanigans on this channel, and giant ground sloths. But we need to talk about two of the biggest obstacles that I mentioned at the beginning of the video. Rats and elephant relatives. Let's talk about the rat problem first. Genetic evidence indicates that the muroids, the family that includes modern rats, migrated to North America during the Miocene. How would theropods handle these small, quick breeding mammals eating their eggs and young? While giant carnivorous reptiles are certainly threatening, if you stop them from growing up in the first place, they'll never get a chance to solo your ecosystem. It's the whole baby Thanos thing, but with dinosaurs. As pointed out by Smithsonian writer Riley Black, this activity could and likely did happen during the Mesozoic. While we yet lack direct fossil evidence of a mammal or other egg eater attacking a dinosaur nest, we do know that small mammals like Repenomammus attacked and ate juvenile Psittacosaurus, and wasn't above attacking adults either. Egg-stealing rivals aren't anything new to the dinosaurs. Eutriconodonts and triconodonts, early mammals closely related to eutherians, were already common by the Jurassic, ranging in size from that of a rat to that of an opossum. And research indicates that overall dinosaurian diversity didn't significantly decrease before the KPG extinction. While placental mammals had already evolved by the late Cretaceous, there was no apparent impact on dinosaur success as a result of their existence. The best modern analogs for this obstacle are crocodilians. They're gigantic reptilian carnivores that are still widespread and successful despite a constant presence of both native and invasive rodent species. 
There are over a million alligators in Florida today, despite the existence of egg-eating mammals. Egg and nest guarding by parents is an observed behavior in crocodilians and was likely a common behavior in dinosaurs as well. While some egg casualties are inevitable, this isn't nearly the existential threat to theropods that it's frequently held up to be. On the other extreme are elephants, and all the problems that gigantic, intelligent, and social herbivores might represent. Miocene North America takes the game to the next level with players like the Amabelodons, shoveled tusker proboscidans. Gomphotheres join the roster, long-jawed elephantids that range from 3 to nearly 5 tons. The most intimidating, however, was the gigantic American Mastodon. It weighed 8 tons on average, with the theoretical maximum going as high as 14. African bush elephants would be the best analogs to determine how these giants would react to megatheropods, given their large body size and similar behavior. Would huge predators be effective against them, or would their power and intelligence be too much? I've taken a lot of your comments and thoughts into consideration for this section, so it is very detailed. Be prepared. Elephants live in herds led by matriarchs, and these herds range from three to more than a dozen individuals. The bulls will leave when they're still subadults, and they either group with other young males or wander solo. They're the kings of modern Africa, and tend to go where they please and do what they please. Who's going to boss around a six-ton beast with spears attached to its face? A lion? Please. Well, actually... Although elephants are way too dangerous for lions to normally attack, it does happen. Single adult lions can take on elephants twice their size. Some prides even specialize in killing elephants. The pride in Chobe National Park killed 74 elephants between 1993 and 1996, and adults, while rare, were not off the menu. A 2009 study found that nearly 40% of elephants at a watering hole chose to flee the area when multiple lion calls were played on the speaker, and over 20% fled from the call of a single lion. Clearly, they recognize the danger, both to themselves and their young. Lion prides have been recorded taking down fully grown adults. It goes both ways, of course. When lions aren't actively hunting, elephants moving in groups can easily disperse entire prides. The mothers stand on the outside in a defensive barrier with the young in the middle, and matriarchs will charge lion prides even if the cats aren't being aggressive. Their priority is to discourage attacks and protect the young. While they're the strongest animal in Africa today, they know they're not invincible. Bull elephants and must, however, fully believe that they're the deadliest creature to ever walk the planet. They're highly aggressive, at least partially due to the pain from the swelling of temporal glands on their face, and they'll attack other animals without provocation. They emit deep rumbles as warnings to other male elephants, and these rumbles can be felt from as far away as 6 kilometers. When they do meet up, they'll often fight and can even break their tusks in the process. They'll fight by locking tusks and swiping up and down, pushing each other back and forth until one gives up and runs away. An injury to the skull would be devastating. Their cranium is actually thin and full of air pockets like honeycomb, making it far less resistant to damage than it looks from the outside. Elephants may be powerful physically, but their brains are also highly developed. They form strong social bonds and even understand death and mourning, becoming depressed if family members die and visiting grave sites for years afterwards. When you have so few young, it makes sense to invest all that you can in them. Female elephants typically give birth once every four years, and usually only have four to five offspring throughout their lifetime. Mammoths and mastodons were likely the same. As mentioned earlier, the elephant equivalents that the theropods would encounter weigh between three and eight plus tons across multiple taxa. We'd see niche partitioning based on prey body size among the invading theropods. The larger mid-range players like Despletosaurus would be going after the smaller ones, like Eubelodon. For the medium-sized proboscidans, heavier hitters would be needed. Acrocanthosaurus and most Saurophaganax would be attempting to hunt Amabelodon and Gomphotherium, but could also punch above their weight class, given how we see elephants today getting taken down by animals half their size. The largest Saurophaganax individuals wouldn't be averse to trying their luck with the gigantic mastodons, especially since Saurophaganax has only ever been discovered in groups. Lion prides of 30 are required to take down an adult elephant today, and a single 5-ton Saurophaganax weighs as much as 20 large male lions by itself. If they either hunted socially or engaged in predatory mobbing, as seems likely, they'd be very comfortable with their food options. But the crux of the battle is the conflict between the American Mastodon and Tyrannosaurus, each the heaviest hitters on their respective teams. This will set the tone for how the invasion goes from here on out, so let's break down their physicals and then their contrasting behavior. The two giants are approximately the same size, with the Mastodon averaging 8 tons and maxing out at 14. We don't have enough well-studied specimens to calculate a true average for Tyrannosaurus rex. Team Acranesis is a dentary, so who even knows, but the smallest confirmed adult, MOR 980, is a little over 6 tons, and the largest confirmed adult, Scotty, is 10.5, with some fragmentary specimens potentially over 11 tons. 
By contrast, the largest predators that the mastodon lived with were entelodonts and machairodonts, maxing out at about 500 kilograms. Even an unremarkable Tyrannosaurus would be 16 times bigger than the native carnivores, although it would obviously prefer to single out smaller mastodon individuals when hunting. There's no sense in being overly risky. What about speed? Modern elephants can move deceptively quickly for their size, although reports of 40 km per hour speedsters appear to be exaggerated. According to Laramendi 2015, the absolute top speed reliably recorded was 25 km per hour by a 2.8 ton Asian elephant male. The paper indicates that most extinct elephant relatives probably couldn't go that quickly thanks to their higher body mass and differing limb proportions. They're decently agile though, and can pivot quickly for their huge size thanks to their compressed body shape. Mastodons were longer and thicker, which would reduce their agility, and that matters. Tyrannosaurs were the most agile big theropods by a large margin, having evolved to take on armored, spiked, pivoting tanks in the form of ceratopsians. They needed to be fast and agile to avoid getting gored by facial horns the size of spears, and would have preferred ambushing from behind when possible. Upcoming research by paleoecologist Kyle Atkins Weltman establishes how Triceratops was extraordinarily agile, so keep an eye out for that. It's also worth noting that an SVP 2023 abstract indicates that T-Rex's linear speed has been underestimated in the past. New 3D modeling yields 23.3 km per hour, and ligament analysis may raise that further in future tests. Weaponry is a category that squarely goes to the theropod. Recent bite force calculations using medium-sized specimens of T-Rex arrived at a 48,000 newton figure, sufficient to pulverize bone. Not every bite would have exerted that much force, but you get the idea. Tyrannosaurus was perfectly adapted for head-on confrontations, even against members of its own species, as Brown 2022 established. Craniofacial biting was very common in Tyrannosaurs, and T-Rex wasn't adverse to even biting the horns of Triceratops if necessary. The tusks of the American Mastodon, while long, curve sharply up and either skew far inwards or far outwards, putting them at a poor angle for combating an agile predator of its own size category. Now that's for a one-on-one -on -one scenario, but what about when the Mastodons are traveling in groups? We don't know much about their social structure, so we're assuming that they behave similarly to bush elephants. The bulls would leave the herd when young and travel on their own, while the matriarchs protect and guide the herd to areas with enough resources. But suddenly, instead of predators only growing large enough to threaten infants, the landscape is thick with carnivores ranging from half-ton dromaeosaurs to 10-plus-ton tyrannosaurs, and the proboscidans would be desirable meals in every stage of their lives. Size is no longer a viable defense, and they'd need to stick together to survive. The problem is that multi-ton animals living in herds are not new to big theropods. Edmontosaurus, which as an adult ranged from 5 to 11 tons, traveled in herds of hundreds or even more, and was still predated upon. While dilution strategies lower the likelihood of any one individual being singled out, it provides plenty of options for predators to target the weak, young, injured, and old. As discussed before, even relatively small predators like lions can cause groups of elephants to split up and try to escape. Pack the firepower of 40 lions into a single animal, and you have Sue. We can't forget the possibility of pack behavior either, and not just for Saurophaganax. Albertosaurus, Tritophonius, and Displetosaurus have all been discovered in bone beds of individuals ranging from young juvenile to large adults. Trackways in Canada also demonstrate three Tyrannosaurs moving together. While that has yet to occur for Tyrannosaurus proper, the fact that it's documented from multiple other Tyrannosaurs implies its plausibility. Collaborative hunting by modern crocodilians, as advanced as driving schools of fish into ambushes and taking turns attacking the group, shows that it's well within the realm of behavior for theropods. Even discounting the likelihood of deliberate, planned hunting techniques, herds of giant herbivores like mastodons or gomphotheres would attract a lot of attention from large-bodied carnivores. Mobbing behavior is very likely, and would have a similar effect on the proboscidans. If one Tyrannosaurus is psychologically devastating, a group of them is a nightmare. Can we call a pack of T-Rexes a nightmare? I'm, I'm making that a thing if it isn't already. Let me know if there's already a name for it in the comments, but I like nightmare. The ecological impact of multiple gigantic carnivores would be huge. Elephants reproduce slowly and might not be able to keep up with the sudden influx of predators they're not adapted to handle. Pressure would be placed on them at every ontogenetic stage by a different species, and growing to adult size is no guarantee of safety when they have to deal with hunters as big as they are or bigger. Since there were so many elephant-like species around North American Miocene, some might adapt to different niches in order to survive, like shrinking down and escaping to the rivers, or growing even larger to use size as a valid defense again, which would spark its own co-evolutionary arms race. For a video exploring a similar concept in detail, go check out Madly Mesozoic's series on the subject. He already did a great job speculating on how elephants would adapt to a theropod presence, so I won't go too much into it here. Final word on the Miocene megafauna, 
Elephant relatives are big, tough, and smart, but they would definitely struggle when there are suddenly multiple predators capable of hunting them. Group defense and social bonding would help keep them alive and stable enough for the battlecruiser theropods to use them as a reliable food source without wiping them out. <sighs> We're almost to the Ice Age. Stay strong. The Pliocene ran from 5 to 2.6 million years ago, a blink of an eye compared to the vast expanses of time we've covered so far. Its average global temperature was about 18 Celsius, so slightly colder than the Mesozoic, but not by a lot. The Rocky Mountains had begun their uplift, turning Western America into a craggy mountain range, and the rest of the continent was a mixture of temperate forests, grasslands, savannas, and deserts, much like a warmer version of today. Mastodons and gomphotheres are still here, hornless rhinos are snacks, Machyrodont saber-tooths and wolves can seriously compete with the smaller theropods, if not outcompete them in many ways. The highly advanced pack behavior of wolves especially would be crucial in protecting against big dromaeosaurs, which don't have evidence of such tactics. Machyrodonts were huge grappler cats, built to bruise, and the largest could go claw to claw with a Utah raptor. Arimatherium was a massive ground sloth that would have been a less than ideal target. At 4-5 to five tons and heavily armed, it would have been too dangerous for any mid-range theropods not already adapted for taking on prey with comparable weaponry. Those that were big enough to overpower it had easier targets in the form of mid-sized elephants. And Glyptotherium would probably be just fine. None of the theropods small enough to want to bother it were adapted for taking on that type of armor. Horses diversify and reach modern sizes here, and again they're fast enough that only medium-sized tyrannosaurs would even be interested. Not really much changes from the Miocene, honestly, except the smaller theropods have a harder time of it now that tough competition has developed in their size range. Here we are, the final and most difficult level. The Pleistocene went from 2.6 million to 10,000 years ago, starting out at normal temps and then plunging into an ice age. Glaciers moved up and down the northern hemisphere in cycles that lasted thousands of years, and the cold temperatures selected for large animals to rise to the forefront. Large body size allows for better temperature regulation and food storage, which were both valuable assets in the Ice Age. Average global temperature fell to 8 degrees Celsius, with some parts of North America averaging as low as 14 below pre-industrial levels. This is the first period in which the climate would be a major issue for the theropods. The megafaunal extinctions of native animals in North America may be partially due to the food shortages caused by ice coverage in the late Pleistocene, and that would especially impact carnivores. The Pleistocene was incredibly similar to our modern world in terms of fauna, but with more spicy versions of animals going around today. You've got your black bears and grizzlies, your deer, sheep, and bison, and then you have glitches in the matrix like the American lion, which was even bigger than the African variety. Camels, glyptodonts, saber-toothed cats, and horses are still around, and the truly gigantic bears like Arctotus would give anything smaller than an Albertosaurus a terrible time. Mastodons are still around, and they're joined by the woolly mammoth and the gigantic Columbian mammoth, which range from 8 to 11 tons on average. Suddenly, the battlecruiser theropods are spoiled for choices, and as the environment cools, they adapt to match. I spoke with paleontology legend Thomas Holtz about how theropods would handle this kind of climate. He said that old genes for fuzziness might activate in response to the lowered temperatures, so we could see woolly theropods. He also referenced Nanooksaurus to state that theropods could already handle temperatures as low as those of southern Alaska. That area ranges from 21 Celsius in the height of summer to negative 17 Celsius in colder winters. Large theropods would be even more equipped to deal with the cold given their high volume to surface area ratios insulating them effectively. As the millennia passed, the theropods would grow bigger and fluffier, continuing to prey upon the slew of megafauna available and build up greater and greater resistance to the increasing cold. But during the last glacial maximum, something new and deadly arrives. Humans. The exact moment of arrival of Homo sapiens in North America is a point of controversy. Recent dating of pollen inside of human footprints from New Mexico indicates arrival more than 20,000 years ago, and climate simulations of when the land bridge between Russia and Alaska could have been crossed say that 25,000 or 16,000 years ago were the best times. Nobody knows for sure when they got here, but the earliest that we know humans were using weapons in North America was more than 15,000 years ago in the Cooper's Ferry, Idaho location. Their toolkit included fire and stone-tipped spears, and they used them to kill and eat animals as large as horses. Would the theropods be able to survive 5,000 years to the end of the Pleistocene, and the end of this video? The North America that these early people entered would be very different from the one our timeline experienced. In this new world, giant cats are still happy to crunch on them, but there are also woolly dragons 50 times the size of any carnivores they'd have encountered back home. Testing of Clovis era weapons on elephant populations in the 1980s showed how they would have been effective on mammoths, so the humans would start competing with the giant theropods for the same food source. As mentioned in the Africa episode, even modern spear hunter cultures still suffer severe casualties when hunting a single elephant. 
those problems would be worsened when the area is also populated with fast, flesh-eating beasts the size of houses, many of which likely lived in groups. Let's put this into perspective, using grizzly bears. According to HughGlass.org, when the Mandan tribe told the explorers Lewis and Clark about how they hunted grizzlies, they reported traveling in hunting parties of 8 to 10 men and painting themselves for war as with an enemy tribe. That's how dangerous a single bear was to a culture far more advanced than the people encountering theropods for the first time. Think about a pack of a dozen Albertosaurus, twice as fast as most humans and over twice the size of the biggest prehistoric bears, protected with Gastralia on their underside. Luckily, the battlecruiser theropods aren't likely to have focused on humans as food options, preferring mammoth meat over spindly primates. If a lone megatheropod did decide to go after a hunting party for whatever reason, the humans would have been fairly capable of defending themselves. There are more Clovis mammoth kill sites in the United States than there are proboscidean kill sites in the entire continent of Africa indicating that the Clovis people were hyper-specialized big game hunters among early humans. But any confrontation with a megatheropod would risk crippling the group. The safest way to deal with the true giant would be to track its hunts and scavenge the bits of mammoth it leaves in its wake, letting it do the work. Smaller pack hunters like Teratophonius would be far more threatening to humans, able to overwhelm with a combination of ferocity, speed, and numbers. Perhaps this world of monsters would have forced North American humans to transition early from a hunter-gatherer lifestyle into an agricultural one, building settlements with defenses that the dragons of ice wouldn't be interested in attacking. That may allow them to come together and build societies large and complex enough to take on the dinosaurs ruling the outside. But given how agriculture in North America didn't develop until after major megafaunal extinction, they may not have been able to get to that point while under existential threat. Theropods would be widespread at this point, from the size of bears to mammoths, and the land bridge between North and South America had been open since the Pliocene. As the glaciers encroached, some populations of theropods would have moved south to warmer climates, although that's a video for another time. It's unlikely that the humans or theropods would have caused one another's extinction in the Pleistocene. The truly gigantic ones didn't have a reason to attack the humans, and the humans would have benefited from following their hunting trails and scavenging from their kills. Spears would have been powerful defenses against the more aggressive species, but humans would have remained on the defensive for a long time against such dangerous, active, and numerous predators. I'd say that both groups can survive to the end of the Pleistocene, as they develop mutual awareness of the danger that the other poses. Imagine the stories that old hunters would have told around their fires, warning their young about the rumbling monsters that lurk outside. Thanks for watching! Subscribe for more speculative ecology videos like this one, and comment with your thoughts. Thank you to paleontologists Thomas Holtz and Evan Johnson Ransom for helping with the research for this episode, especially on the climate and theropod elephant interactions. I work hard to make every video better than the last, so thank you all for your feedback and thoughtful comments. Join the channel to gain loyalty badges and other perks, which include early access to videos at the Megatheropod tier and above. I'm the Vivid End, and I'll see you next time.